And if there is no room for God to do something different than what's on our program, then that's a tough place to be. And I would encourage you as a leader, change that next week. Welcome to the One Cry Podcast, a nationwide call for spiritual awakening. The goal, accelerating the movement of God through sharing revival truth, stories, and reports. Well, here we are again on the One Cry Podcast, and my name is Byron Paulus, the uh, founder of the One Cry Movement, and kind of uh, substituting for Bill Elif and Kyle Reno, but hey, God is doing so much around the nation. There are so many stories surfacing and so many opportunities to be able to hear reports of what God is doing that we are taking a little detour right now and the way we're conducting these One Cry podcasts, but it's an exciting detour. And uh, it's really accelerating, I believe, the movement as we learn and grow together. And uh, I hope you, especially so many of you are pastors and you have uh, constituents that you're talking to. And, and I know so many of you are doing everything you can to feel what God is doing right now. And uh, let me just begin here by saying this last Sunday as I was speaking in a church and I thought, man, how in the world do I want to end this? Um, one of the things I did is I encouraged everybody there to go to onecry.com and take the seven-day personal revival journey. It's right there, I think, on the landing page. And I thought, and I, and I said, wouldn't it be an incredible thing if we all came back next Sunday and there has been an entire congregation that has taken seven days during this week to meet with God in the same process of uh, honesty and humility and obedience and repentance, some of those things, drawing on the grace of God and faith and so forth. So uh, all that kind of ties into having Jeremy's story again on our podcast today uh, from Austin, Texas, Campus Renewal, Every Student Sent. And man, Jeremy, you've been in the passion of your heart, the fire in your heart has been for revival, renewal, and on campuses, particularly for yeah, decades, literally, right? I know you're not that old, but let's just say about, about three decades. Three decades. So, uh, wow. And um, as we kind of closed the last time, uh, we just talked, we love the stories. I want to hear more stories. Uh, but also, what was notable about the movement at Asbury, but even subsequently, it seems like there are some characteristics of this movement that really may be different than some of the other movements we're familiar with. So what's notable and maybe a story to substantiate it or whatever that you uh, picked up while you've been uh, really kind of a, uh, a a real, I don't want to say reporter, but somebody that's really looking deep and diving deep into what God's doing. Well, that's a difficult question because there's a lot, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. one, I was just asking the Lord, you know, of all the things I could highlight, because I know you're talking to a lot of people, um, what are some of them? One of the ones that I felt he wanted me to highlight on this thing is going to be a little different. And that, and maybe that's why he wants me to do it. I don't know. Um, when you look at the history of revival awakening in the past in our country, um, you see that there's often sometimes a link between a shaking that occurs afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, uh, the Great Awakening birthed America. But America was birthed through a revolution that was actually quite destructive to our to our to a lot of people in their lives, right? Even our founders, many of them lost their fortunes, lost their their family things, a lot of lot of pain uh, that came. But it was the Great Awakening that caused the American Revolution to produce a country that has produced so much freedom and missionary activity across the world, as opposed to the French Revolution, which ended with guillotines. Mm. And so. Um, you know, there was a difference in our revolution is as, as disruptive as it was, but it was often because of the Great Awakening. Now, if you go to the Civil War and you yeah. see the businessmen's prayer revival in the 1856 and and uh, everything that was going on in the noon hour prayer meetings and how that changed our country. But shortly thereafter, we had the Civil War, yeah. which rocked our country. And so oftentimes when God is is in a period of shaking or about to begin one, both of those things, in a period and about to begin, because periods are not just so simple as we see in our history books. They ebb and flow, and there's not a day that one starts, but it's a, a period. Uh, when you're in a period of shaking, which certainly we've been in, if you think anyone's been around during COVID and all the uh, things that are just literally 
historic, earth, earth-wise historic, not just city-wise or, or you know, um, we've been through shaking and I believe there's more shaking to come. That those were warnings of the Lord. Why is he shaking? Because in that shaking, he produces righteousness and brings people to himself. Uh, and so um, I think there's more shaking to come for our country. And I also think it's interesting that in the midst of that shaking, we are seeing revival. Mm-hmm. And that's a principle that a lot of people don't talk about, but it has been part of many revivals, this idea of a shaking. Uh, you think about the 70s. We, we've watched the, the Jesus Revolution movie that coincided with the Collegiate Day of Prayer and with the Asbury Revival. All that occurred, that release was all at the same time, time by the Lord, not by any man or, or woman. Um, but if you look back in the 70s and 60s when that was going on, a tremendous time of shaking with the Vietnam War, with the hippie movement, free love, all kinds of things. And at the same time, you had the Jesus movement, which founded, founded really uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit in a lot of ways, modern concepts of that, the, the, the Christian worship movement. Anyway, my point is, I don't want people to be discouraged if we continue in a time of shaking, thinking that that is discounts revival. When I went to Fiji, and I've been to revival spots around the world that, where the Lord has touched down, mm-hmm. you know, there was, if you go to Suva, where the not the native Fijians live, but the uh, the Indians from India live, who did not encounter the Fijian revival, mm-hmm. there was a lot of corruption and bad stuff in the main cities. But if you went out into the jungles where the natives lived, um, and the Heal the Land team and all that, you saw things like reviving of coral reefs, poison water turning into regular water, like Moses, you know, but literally happening in modern day, uh, people coming back to life, being raised from the dead. And those were two things going on on the same island, you know? And so... My point is, is that sometimes when there's an, 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 a, a, a bringing up of a, of a, of a, a good versus evil or a, or a negative things, that doesn't discount the fact that God is moving in revival. And sometimes people say, well, if those two things are simultaneously going on, this must not be revival. Well, mm-hmm. that's just not history. And it's also not biblical when you look at the actual biblical examples of revival, too. Why, sure. I'm so glad you mentioned that. You go back to 1857, 58, you know, that permitting, I guess, started in September, maybe there in Fulton Street. October, a major bank collapses and financial collapse. And you think, as we're having this podcast interview, we're on the verge of these banks collapsing and then the Civil War. So uh, I'll tell you, if, if there's already division. We know that, right? And we, we know there's uh, enormous materialism and greed. And if that starts to be impacted and people don't, the division is just going to escalate and who knows. But also, uh, I've heard historians say if it wasn't for the revival of 1857, 58, the Civil War would have destroyed our nation forever. Exactly. Hundreds of thousands in the the Confederate Army and so forth came to Christ uh, because of the seeds that were planted. So this whole thing isn't so squeaky clean. Everything's going to be fine hereafter, right? Yeah. And it's important to know that because oftentimes when when, when we're disillusioned or disappointed by something of the Lord, it's not because of the Lord. It's because of false expectations. And it's not to say that God can't and doesn't transform cultures through revival. It's to say that we see examples of these two tracks running there, there's there are always detractors and, yeah. and and sometimes the shaking is going on as the revival is going on god yeah. is bigger than our black and than our boxes of black and white it's not that he there's there's truth and there's falsehood there's right and wrong but my point is that god's activity is so much bigger than we often put in our religious boxes very yeah. important that no, we don't just discount say what god is doing across our country which we're about to talk about just because we're also going through shaking and we may be going through more. In fact, it's all the more reason to press into his manifest presence and not run away from it. And I'm afraid that some believers, if they're not adequately prepared, may try to run away from the Lord's presence thinking, well, that wasn't authentic because look at all the shaking. Wow. That's so good. That's, that's such a foundation to even what we're getting ready to discuss further and what's going on uh, to put it in that context, because, uh, well, we've talked some about, one of the marks of this particular stirring or moving is is humility. And uh, wow, there, we're going to need humility if, if this shaking continues or intensifies. So uh, yeah, I remember the call a week or so ago with the collegiate leaders, and one of the things they said was notable was humility. Talk to us about how you observed that, especially there at Asbury. Sure, I will. And then and then I'm feeling a spirit leading me into also another one that maybe hasn't been discussed, but humility for sure is something a lot of people have pointed out because um, 
you know, the, there was no uh, any leader trying to manifest themselves over that at, at Asbury. There was a submission even among the Asbury leadership to sort mm -hmm. of get out of the way and let God move. And it, it's so tempting in a revival or a time where God's spirit moves to try to claim that as if it were our own or to try to control God in a certain way uh, or put boundaries on what God can or can't do. That's a surefire way as a leader to mm -hmm. shut down. But humility says, I'm going to back away and I'm going to steward and just do everything I can to see God's presence come. And certainly both the students and the administrators at, at Asbury were doing all that they could to walk in humility towards one another and also towards the outsiders that were coming to their campus um, to, to uh, and that was a big part of it. But one thing I want to point out that also was a big part uh, is the concept, the, the Western concept of time. George Otis has talked a lot about this in previous times. He's done a lot of studying on revival and awakening over the years. But the Western concept of time, you know, we're always looking at our watches, you know, we're all, or we don't have them anymore, our iWatches or our iPhones or whatever it is. You know, we're always looking to see, okay, well, so church, for example, this is a manifestation of it. So now we're on Sundays. Sometimes yeah. the pastor goes over for five minutes or whoever, man, we, 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 you know, all of a sudden you lose people's attention because they're thinking about the next thing. That's an American Western, not just American, but a Western concept of time. And we try to say, well, God, you must show up in this slot in this way at this time. And if you do outside that, I'm not, I'm not really interested. Well, the problem is that God doesn't operate that way. And mm. because we have that time centric perspective about everything as Westerners, it actually inhibits revival. Now at Asbury, you would frequently see a worship set that didn't, it didn't have an ending or a beginning. You, you didn't have a, a set beginning or ending time that was had to be for a particular testimony or a group of verses that were going to be shared. In fact, as different worship leaders, you people will say, well, how did they have so many different worship leaders for so long? They would literally pray, feel to go into the audience and pick a few people who they knew from students and whatnot, even other campuses that would could lead worship. They would then call them into a back room, pray over them for about an hour, have them then go back and sit in the auditorium and, and get immersed back into what God was doing. And then they would bring them up on the stage. Wow. And so it was sort of like a continual um of that. And so the, the idea of, of trying to confine that into this has to happen in five minutes or 10 minutes, or that's a surefire way to shut down God's spirit. When we try to put earthly time and, and limits on who he is and what he's doing. And we often get into a moment where God's spirit is descending in a gathering or even in our own personal prayer times. And we move on to the next thing because you know, it's time's up. Yeah. And I'm telling you, that's one of the biggest killers of revival. It's also one of the biggest releasers of God's spirit of revival when we're willing to give him ownership over time and say, even though my brain has set this to be time up, you own time. And so you get to decide when time's up. And so if you're moving and say Sunday service is quote set to end, and what will people do if they can't go home or go to lunch? We say, mm -hmm. we're giving it to God and we're going to trust him to continue to take us. And that is what has happened in many churches across the United States right now. For yeah. so many churches that their services just continued and then baptisms spontaneously continued yeah. and then yeah. worship services continued. And those who didn't go, well, time's up, let's move on. Yeah. Those who didn't do that and who pressed in and just said, okay, Lord, if this is what you want to do, well, many of them are still having spontaneous baptisms and you know, worship going around the clock and things like that. So they're making space for God where before everything was like to the second and, yeah. and don't let it, there be any silent space, you know, everything's got, and that's, I agree. That's just contrary. I think to God wants us to wait upon him and uh, be quiet and listen to him speak to our hearts. You know, as we were on this call and I know, I don't know when all these podcasts will be aired, but um, with these collegiate leaders, right after we hung up, I literally got a call from a gentleman in India, Bangalore, India. And he said, Byron, I had to call you. We called a prayer meeting this morning for two hours from 5 to 7 a.m. for pastors. One pastor, he said, traveled 20 hours just to be here for that prayer meeting. But he said it went till 10 o'clock. We couldn't stop the prayer time. And uh, to just have that mentality, if God says, keep going, we keep going. And uh, let him be Lord, even of the clock. Boy, that's that's tough for us Westerners. Or, I mean, you think about the traditional way that churches is, and I know that 
we're talking to leaders, pastors across the country right now with this podcast. You know, think about your church service, whether you're a leader in church or a pastor in church or whatever you are in church, a volunteer leader or a pastor. Think about it. So much of what we do in church would continue if God never showed up. Yeah. And 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 also so much if God did show up would be limited because we're moving on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, and and so sometimes the biggest limiter of seeing God's manifest presence come, which is really what revival is. Yeah. Sometimes the biggest limiter is our structures. And we're expecting God to fit in the box we've created, in this case, an hour, hour, 10 minutes, or this particular slot on the on the program. And he wants to fit in a different way. And it is our actual structure, not even our words or actions, but actually the structure that is actually preventing God from, from moving. It's not that God won't bust open that structure. Thankfully, by his grace, he does. Yeah. But again, we can always position ourselves to be in the best place. And I think as leaders, we need to boldly, and it I know I've been a pastor and a leader for 30 years. So I know who I'm speaking to here. We need to boldly say, push back against others who would say, well, but you know, if you do that, da, 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 or, you know, you might lose your job or whatever. Yeah. We have to boldly say, how much do we want God's spirit in our church? Yeah. How much are we willing to give up to have God's, to have God's presence and to be willing to make room for him? Yeah. And if there is no room for God to do something different than what's on our program, yeah. then that's a tough place to be. And I would encourage you as a leader, change that next week. Man, so good, Jeremy. And uh, man, you've defined revival in these last few minutes, uh, manifest presence of God. And uh, I, I just feel like, and, and you would know this, but for so many years leading up to this, it's like there are so many misconceptions of revival. You know, it's a week of meetings or uh, it's emotionalism or staticism or whatever, or evangelism uh, versus revival or whatever. And I think one of the things, and I'd love you to respond to this, I think one of the things that is happening is revival is being legitimized. I think if people are saying, number one, it really can happen. I mean, I think people were saying, I've heard about in history. I'm tired of history. Why can't it happen now? So I just think there's this legitimizing of revival that puts you as a pastor uh, in a whole new arena that people are going to be accepting and receiving of some of these things Jer Jeremy's just talking about for the first time, and they wouldn't have previously. So I... I uh, Man, I'm glad you said what you did and kind of detoured there because I think um, people are going to see it legitimized when the pastor does start getting out of the traditional MO. <laughs> and, and, you know, the word that comes to me is I'm, just, I'm trying to hear from the Lord and just what is the word is window. Yeah. As a leader, whatever you're a volunteer yeah. leader, whatever sphere of influence God's given you in your church, mm -hmm. revivals, because we're not in heaven and we're on earth, at least what we've seen from history. Now, this might change. I mean, the Lord can do anything. There seems to be a window, a window meaning a window of time. Mm -hmm. So as humans, we kind of feel like, well, it should always be available for, but yeah, and that's true. The Lord is always available. But in moments of revival, they are moments. They tend to have a beginning and an ending. It's it's part of the brokenness of the world we live in. I hate to be, I, I've been around the block enough. I'm just going to say things that maybe aren't popular or aren't the right thing to say, but I'm telling you, it's part, the fact that revival ends is part of the brokenness of the world we live in. It is a sucky place to be. And, and it's not as good as heaven. <laughs> and one day the Lord will fully restore and there will just be revival constantly because we'll be in his presence constantly. Amen. So but right now yeah. there's, there's a window, there's a beginning and an ending usually. And so what does that mean for you as a pastor or a leader? It means if you don't act now in the window, you could lose opportunity that you will not have when the window closes. That doesn't seem fair or right. And it is broken and it isn't fair, but it is the reality of the earth we live in now. So when the Lord, by his grace, manifests his presence and it awakens his people, it's an opportunity for you as a leader to be able to do things and sort of get away with things that are positive in the Lord. I don't mean negative things uh, in the Lord that you can't yeah. in other times. So I yeah. would encourage you as a leader, act boldly now on what God is telling you. Don't just rush it out of, you know, fear of loss. No, that's not the Lord. But what the Lord is speaking to you and it's in your heart to do, and you know the Lord has put it there, now's the time. Well, I was sharing with somebody this week, Jeremy, about uh, Luke chapter five and the catch a fish, you know, launch out in the deep, enough fish to sink those two boats. And, uh, and, and I shared with this pastor and this leader, I said, you know, I find it interesting 
Jesus didn't say, now go get some camouflage boats and some uh, new nets and go back out and fish and you'll catch fish. And I'll take the same nets, take the same boats. I'm here now. My presence is here now and see what I can do. And I think that is a window for pastors now because of the nature of the way Asbury didn't have celebrities, as you mentioned, and the way they didn't use all of the modern technology that sometimes we think is so critical and necessary. Yeah. And um, it's a window to say, hey, and I know I, I attend a large church. I was out of town last week, but I saw it online. And uh, they use all those things as wonderful tools. I'm not criticizing the tools. But last Sunday, it was just a piano on stage, nothing else. And there was something powerful about no distractions, just an opportunity to wait on the Lord. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you said that. Pastor, leaders, bold, you know what whatever really, you call it. You know what that really is? It's the same concept of Sabbath. Mm, there it's you go. It's saying that when I stop, mm. will God continue? It's a faith step. The reason where my life changed on the understanding of rest and Sabbath many, many years ago, 10 plus years ago, I don't know, maybe 15 or so, was when I began to just, God gave me a revelation that actually Sabbath was one of the biggest faith steps you could take if you were an activist. Most of us who are leaders are activists in some way. We want to get things done. And you're basically saying, I will stop when I don't have to. Yeah. When I'm not being forced to, trusting that when I stop, when I don't do everything I can do, God will fill in. And in, in essence, the, your church that you just described was making a faith step. We yeah. could do all this stuff. And it's not bad stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Extra work isn't bad, right? Gathering more manna is not necessarily immoral, right? right. Unless right. God says, open the place for me to and give me the space. So that is really what your church is practicing is Sabbath rest, asking the Lord to fill in the space of what they could have done more. And I think that, that that's where we all need to be because we have had an unhealthy swing when mm -hmm. you think of 50, 60 years of right. actional church. Yeah. It's not bad things, yep, yep. but it begins to swing to where it's wrong and to where we're not leaving room for the Lord. We're not saying we're, we're literally trying to do God's job in a way that is unhealthy. Obviously God wants us to participate with him, but he doesn't want us to be him. <laughs> and so, so, you know, we, we've kind of gotten so attractional and so concerned about getting rears in seats yeah. that uh, we almost are like, as you read in some of the prophets, entertainment rather than yeah. our center being, will Lord, the Lord's presence show up? which is why we can literally have spiritual Christian gatherings mm. that when God doesn't show up, we don't notice it. Yeah. That should call us to our knees in repentance. And that repentance looks like changing our attractional ways sometimes when the yeah. Lord leads us in that way. And I think we, we have in America more of a need to lead in the way your church just did mm. than we do the other way. It's not that the other way is bad. It's just that in our culture, we've kind of, we're leaning the, uh, the other way. So we need to push back against that and find the Lord in those quiet, still spaces where we could do more. And I heard one seminary student at Asbury said that one of the characteristics, it was a powerful, uh, uh, I felt like, blog he did on Gen Z. And he said, uh, there was repentance, but the repentance was driven by the kindness of God. And I went, you know, Romans 2, 4, the goodness of God should lead us to repentance. And so, Man, I could talk all day on with you on revival number one, and uh, I love it every time we get to do that. But let's let's close this by you and I just both, um, just a little season of prayer, just maybe uh, for pastors, for leaders, for what we've just been talking about, and maybe each of us just pray briefly for a couple, three times, and close our time in prayer, crying out to the Lord uh, for what He wants to do. So, Lord, we don't want to race past what we've uh, been talking about, what you're teaching us, what our takeaways are. God, would you help us to be able to sift through all that you're doing and let you resurrect in our hearts or implant and embed within our hearts exactly what it is you want us to do to further your work at this moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. God, give us an understanding of what it means for each of us to rest, to pause mm. voluntarily to give you space. Mm. Uh, that's been something you've brought up as a theme by your spirit in this podcast that we weren't anticipating. So we just ask you 
to show each one of us across the nation right now, Father, give us wisdom and revelation for where we can voluntarily stop, not because we have to, but because we're giving you room. Mm. Lord, show us what that looks like. We ask you by your Holy Spirit, your revelation to honor yourself, to glorify yourself by right now in the hearts and minds of leaders, mm. to speak to them of where rests, what that looks like in their congregation and their families and their daily activities and their devotions and the books they read. All of these things, we ask you to give us tactical information for how we are each called to faith you and rest. I pray for campuses, Lord, who are still seeking you, administrators and chaplains and student ministry leaders saying, what is it you want us to do? God, may they be bold, as Jeremy was saying, and courageous and say, I don't care what everybody else thinks. I, I, God, deliver me from fear of man. Help me to be able to hear from you and do whatever it is that you want us to do. To do. And no matter how uh, ridiculous it may look in the man of eyes, but obedient in your eyes. God, do that, I pray, and on campuses all across this nation. God, I also just ask for forgiveness for the times I have had fear of man. You know, it's a regular thing, Father. We all face this. None, no one of us is a, above uh, beyond that, Father, we know that we need your strength every day to continue to persist. So I ask you, Father, for a breaking off of, of that off all of us, that we would walk in courage, we walk in humility, that we would walk in your forgiveness, uh, Lord, that we would be fearful of you and not men or women. God, give us revelation as to your word. And Lord, may we be may we stick with that as we interact with each other, Father, that we would be courageous, kind, and bold, though, at the same time, leaders mm. uh, who hear your words and accurately move forward on them, Father. Lord, forgive us, myself yeah. included, for um, mm. really fearing people more than you and fearing people's expectations more than yours. Yes, Lord. We ask you to give us a revelation today of your expectations yes. that surpasses the expectations of others so that we would turn to you in those moments. And the gift of repentance isn't a one-time thing. Lord, I, I need you to put that in my heart. And I, I need to be willing to turn. Turn us again, oh God, unto thee and cause your face to shine upon us, Lord. Give me a heart that is eager to turn. So much pride in my own life. So much caring about how others perceive me when what really matters is what you know me to be. And God, I, I just want to at this moment, to be the type of person, God, you can work in freely, fully first, and then can work through to do your purposes. So Lord, on this podcast today, everybody that's uh, been listening, God, we need you. God, sometimes revivalists are the last ones to think they need revival. Just like doctors are the last ones that think they need a physical or lawyers, the last one that think they need a will. God, give us a, a spirit of neediness. God, we yes. are poor and needy. And if we don't have you, God, it just becomes um, more work of the flesh. So God, may you have us. May our hearts be filled with uh, surrendered and yielded and uh, available to you in every way. So yes. God, uh, we just ask, uh, Jeremy, we just knit our hearts together and say, God, may this only be the beginning. May literally we be blessed to see the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. May and we so. pray this in the powerful, wonderful, reviving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you. And thank you, all those of you that were listening. Man, go to onecry.com and uh, download, I said at the beginning of the broadcast, seven-day revival journey. Get your congregations, get your constituents, ministry leaders. Wouldn't it be something if literally thousands were daily for the next seven days seeking the Lord day by day for a fresh work in our hearts? God bless you. See you next week on the podcast.